Radio Westeros, Episode 80, The First Men. Spoilers all books! Hello and welcome to Radio Westeros. I'm your host, Lady Guinevere, and with me is Yoke Boy. Yeah, hello there. Thanks so much for listening. Today we have a packed episode for you all about The First Men. This will be the first instalment on your new series about the four central human ethnic groups of Westeros. The First Men, the Andals, the Roinar and the Valyrians. As we seek to explore the culture and history of Westeros and examine its people. And today, as we said, we'll focus on the First Men, the first human inhabitants of Westeros, who have an intriguing history dating back to their embryonic days in Essos. So where exactly did the First Men originate? And why did they leave their homes en masse on a westward migration? Were they regressors or prophecies or both? Let's explore the mystery as well as consider what we know about their culture, technology, and language as they sought to find new lands and adapt. Next, we'll follow the First Men's journey across the Arm of Dawn as they head north through the region in search of green pastures. What must it have been like to find two other intelligent species already inhabiting their new land, one of which could control beasts and birds and see through magical trees? We'll follow the story of war and peace as the ancient timeline crossed the threshold from the Dawn Age to the Age of Heroes. And the Age of Heroes began as a time of peace between men and children of the forest with the Pact, but still there were a hundred petty kingdoms vying for power, not to mention a terrifying era known as the Long Night that shook Westeros to its core. And so we'll look at the aftermath of that, as well as how those petty kingdoms began to gradually consolidate and centralize. Finally, we'll take you on a tour of First Men Westeros before the coming of the Andals and through ancient histories and intriguing legends piece together what the oldest houses in Westeros were doing thousands of years ago, painting a picture of an era gone by. While details from this era are scarce, we've weaved them together to portray old Westeros from the coastlines of Dawn, where the very first First Men settled, to the frozen expanses beyond the wall, where the Age of Bronze and Runes has been perfectly preserved. So stay with us to learn all about the First Men as we seek to understand the culture and characters of modern Westeros by understanding the rich history of this enduring ethnic group who still dominate the North after 10,000 years. From mysterious runestones to blood magic to Brandon the Builder, we've packed this episode with as much intrigue as we could muster to bring the dry histories to life in vivid color. And one point to note is that this series is designed to overlap with our recent series on magical species, namely dragons, others, and the children of the forest. And while some of the same aspects are touched upon, we'll endeavour to take on the first men's perspective and provide further details to offset too much repetition. Consider this all one long series that will interleave in places. And before we get started with the episode, we want to give a shout out to all of our patrons who make these episodes possible. And a very special thanks go to our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragon Sail patron, Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Alex, Akka in the Company of the Cats, Chris B. the Song of Ice, Seth, Kelly, Laura, Sister Winter, Moltude, John Wargarian, and M.T. Walls, first of his name, as well as B-Word and Mr. J, the Bear and the Maiden Fair, and Sir Tim of House Jib Jab Hot Dog Shop. House motto, we forge the chains we wear in life. And if you want to support Radio Westeros and keep this ship sailing, please consider becoming a patron on a per-episode basis with tiers starting at $3.00. Head over to patreon.com slash Radio Westeros to check out our tiered reward system where you can earn privileges such as personalised shoutouts and our ad-free early release schedule. And now, let's get started with The First Men. Beyond the domains of the Fisher Queens... Other peoples rose and fell and fought, struggling for a place in the sun. 
Some maesters believe that the first men originated in the grasslands before beginning the long westward migration that took them across the Arm of Dawn to Westeros. Before we begin to trace the first men's migration from Essos to Westeros, let's first consider who they were, where they came from, and what we know of their culture all those thousands of years ago. Yeah, the timeline is a blur that far back. Putting precise dates on these early events is made purposefully impossible by George, who is trying to emulate the difficulties real-life historians face when seeking to piece together the ancient world. Given A Song of Ice and Fire's quasi-medieval setting, the maesters of the Citadel aren't equipped with the modern technologies such as carbon dating that are used in our real world. And so, we're left with a muddled ancient history that only adds to the intrigue and verisimilitude of George's world-building. But within the confusion, there are broad guesstimates of ancient timelines offered by in-universe maesters. And the earliest records speak of a dawn age, which began with two disparate species, the children of the forest and the giants, inhabiting what would be known as Westeros, together for many thousands of years. As we discussed in our Children of the Forest episode, the children, known to themselves as those who sing the Song of Earth, were a diminutive species who wielded magical green abilities over nature, skin-changing, green-dreaming, and green-seeing. They hunted with obsidian blades and carved strangely observant faces onto their sacred weirwood trees from which their green seers, who were effectively their leaders, could gaze out in order to witness the events of past, present, and even future. They worshipped the old gods and animistic religions centered around the natural world that held there are gods everywhere, a concept inextricably tied to the notion that the green seers could be watching anything at any time. And standing in contrast to the children were the giants, a species of large humanoids who are physically strong and brutish, able to carry crude weapons such as wooden clubs, making them very dangerous in combat fought at close quarters. In the world book, Maester Yandel claims that all ancient accounts characterise the giants as huge and powerful creatures, but simple. And Yandel goes on to explain that, quote, Men of the Watch say the wildlings have tales of the giants living uneasily alongside the children. The word uneasily sticks out there as one of the several clues that the children and the giants did not live in some sort of blissful natural utopia together during the Dawn Age, before the coming of man. In fact, Maester Kennet's study of a barrow near Long Lake unearthed, quote, a giant's burial with obsidian arrowheads found amidst the extant ribs. Given obsidian was the children's weapon of choice, this finding provides convincing evidence of conflict between the two species. With the children's ability to skin change animals and fashion deadly razor sharp arrowheads, and the giant's formidable size and power, it seems likely that these two species were uncomfortable bedfellows in Westeros. However, in spite of this proof of conflict, there's no indication of huge, widespread war between the children and giants. And so perhaps neither species were prepared for the mass migration of human first men with superior weaponry into the territory that they'd called their own for tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. And with that grounding of proto-Westeros, let's now consider what was occurring to the east in Essos during the latter millennia of the Dawn Age. Yandel says that, according to the most well-regarded accounts from the Citadel, anywhere from eight to 10,000 years ago, in the southernmost reaches of Westeros, a new people crossed the strip of land that bridged the Narrow Sea and connected the eastern lands with the land in which the children and giants lived. It's difficult to say even roughly how long mankind and early civilization stretches back before that point, because, according to Yandel, In the first stage of the world, the Dawn Age, men were not lettered. We can be certain that the world was far more primitive, however, a barbarous place of tribes living directly from the land with no knowledge of the working of metal or the taming of beasts. 
What little is known to us of those days is contained in the oldest of texts, the tales written down by the Andals, by the Valerians, and by the Giscari, and even by those distant people of fabled Ashai. Yet however ancient those lettered races, they were not even children during the Dawn Age. So what truths their tales contain are difficult to find, like seeds among chaff. What can most accurately be told about the Dawn Age? The eastern lands were awash with many peoples, uncivilized as all the world was uncivilized, but numerous. Although the broad strokes account of what was going on in Westeros at that point seems straightforward and reasonable enough, what was going on in Essos in the time before the first men's migration is more difficult to discuss with any degree of accuracy. But there are a few tidbits of information scattered here and there which do at least allow for speculation. And one of the most intriguing yet seldom discussed snippets is that maesters of the citadel believed that the cradle of human civilization was the vast expanse of grasslands now known as the Dothraki Sea in Essos. Yandel says, It was here amidst these grasses that civilization was born in the Dawn Age. 10,000 years ago or more, when Westeros was yet a howling wilderness inhabited only by the giants and children of the forest, the first true towns arose beside the banks of the River San and beside the myriad vassal streams that fed her on her meandering course northward to the Shivering Sea. The histories of those days are lost to us, sad to say, for the kingdoms of the grass came and went in large measure before the race of man became literate. Only the legends persist. And dealing with legends is a tricky business. East of the Bone Mountains, a mythical civilization known as the Great Empire of the Dawn was said to be ruled over by its first ruler, the God on Earth, for 10,000 years. Even further east lies the mysterious city of Ashai, a place that exemplifies the limits of our knowledge and understanding of Planetos. The World Book states, Even the Ashai do not claim to know who built their city. They will say only that a city has stood here since the world began and will stand here until it ends. Whether the existence of the Great Empire of the Dawn and ancient Ashai could work with the out-of-the-grasslands theory or whether there were other more mysterious forms of civilization before towns began sprouting up beside the banks of the River San, including those who sculpted the mystifying oily black stone found in disparate regions of the map, is left open to the reader's interpretation. However, keeping on topic, we should put these legends aside and consider further the notion that some maesters believe that the first men originated in the grasslands before beginning the long westward migration that took them across the Arm of Dawn to Westeros. And one point to note is that Yandel also speculates that the Andals, who would later become bitter enemies to the first men, quote, may have arisen in the fertile fields south of the Silver Sea, so it's entirely possible that the first men and Andals shared a common origin point, or at least were familiar with each other, perhaps in proto-forms of their cultures that would one day combine to form modern Westeros. And Yandel goes on to mention other cultures native to the area, such as the long-legged Gips and the pale-haired Zakora, but notes that... Most of these peoples are gone now, their gods and heroes all but forgotten. One of the explanations given for the demise of the diverse people of the grasslands is the rising of the conquering Sarnori Empire, because as Yandel explains, at its height their great kingdom included all the lands watered by the Sarn and its vassals, and the three great lakes that were all that remained of the Silver Sea. And so, when we read the Daenerys chapters in which she travels through the beautifully blooming Dothraki Sea to Vaes Dothrak, we should consider that she might be passing through the same territory that the first men hailed from, drinking from the same rivers and streams that facilitated those first small towns and rumblings of early civilization. And speaking of Vaes Dothrak, when Danny visits the great fertile lake called the Womb of the World, 
Her handmaiden, Jiqui, tells her that it was from those very waters that the first man emerged riding the first horse a thousand thousand years ago. While this legend might be considered a Dothraki-centric tall tale, could there be a grain of truth in the notion that this lake might have provided sustenance for early man, lining up with the speculation from maesters that early civilization came from this grasslands area? Mankind could have evolved in a similar manner to the way we did in our world, traversed the landscape as hunter-gatherers, then found those vital watering holes at the womb of the world and along the Sarn and the Silver Sea, then began to settle and master the surrounding lands in increasing numbers to create the first settlements and towns. And with mention of the thriving Sarnori Empire controlling the grasslands and wiping out entire populations, perhaps we should keep in mind potential parallels to another mass migration from Essos to Westeros. The Rhoynar were led away from their motherland along the banks of the River Rhoyne by Nymeria, who, after terrible hardship, managed to settle her people in Dawn. And of course, the major causal factor for this physical and cultural upheaval was the emphatic rise of Valyria. The Rhoynar had become victims to an aggressive freehold empire that led directly to Nymeria guiding her refugee followers to Westeros. While no clear explanation is offered as to why the first men decided to move west, We can wonder if the Sarnori Empire posed a similar threat, prompting the migration. Westeros offered plentiful lands, after all, and although the children of the forest put up strong resistance when the first men arrived, that conflict might have paled in comparison to the prospect of being enslaved, subjugated, or extinguished by the Sarnori. And keeping one eye on the history books, there's evidence of another motive for a culture upping sticks and leaving their homeland. While the Andals might have also had dragon and Valyria-shaped problems of their own to deal with, which is acknowledged as a possibility by Maesters of the Citadel, Yandel offers further explanation as to why they set off on their aggressive westward conquest. In the oldest of the holy books, the Seven-Pointed Star, it is said that the Seven themselves walked among their people in the hills of Andalos, and it was they who crowned Hugor of the Hill and promised him and his descendants great kingdoms in a foreign land. And so Hugor of the Hill, who is said to have been the first king of the Andals, was acting on a promise about the future delivered by gods, which sounds to us a lot like prophecy, given that House Targaryen also moved westwards on the word of a prophecy experienced in a dragon dream by Daenys the Dreamer in advance of the cataclysm known as the Doom that wiped out Valyria, perhaps we can conclude that prophecy has played a starring role in westward migrations. Whether the First Men were also entangled with prophecy is impossible to say given that we aren't even sure what religion they followed before accepting the Children of the Forest's old gods during the Pact Era. All the World Book offers is that they worshipped strange gods, leading readers to wonder if the First Men's original religion was one unique to their culture, now lost to time, or if it was related to any of the plethora of Eastern religions documented in the main series or world book. So, while it is possible that those strange gods were pointing westward, we can't draw any firm conclusions due to the dearth of evidence. In fact, not even knowing a thing about the first men's religion at the time of their crossing exemplifies just how little we do know about them. The question arises... Why does the seven-pointed star continue to circulate among the Andals even in present-day Westeros when we can't get even so much as a name for the First Men's original faith? The answer lies in First Men culture. As we heard in an earlier quote from Yandel, in the first age of the world, the Dawn Age, men were not lettered. And what we do know of that era comes from accounts documented by the Andals and other cultures. Given the Andals were not in Westeros during the Dawn Age, they had to have got their information from somewhere. And there are two main ways the early tales of the First Men's Conquest could have been carried over time. The first is via folklore, history residing in collective memory spread by word of mouth from generation to generation in legends and songs and stories. 
And the other method of transmitting information over time was the first men's version of writing. While they weren't lettered exactly, not by modern alphabet and quill and pen methods anyway, they did write via runes. The concept of runes in A Song of Ice and Fire was lifted from real-world history. Before widespread use and availability of paper, early Germanic peoples, circa the 1st and 2nd centuries, used to carve symbols from their runic alphabets into wood and stone. And so George has emulated the runic tradition in his depiction of the first men. As Yandel puts it, the age of heroes lasted for thousands of years in which kingdoms rose and fell, noble houses were founded and withered away, and great deeds were accomplished. Yet what we truly know of those ancient days is hardly more than what we know of the Dawn Age. The tales we have now are the work of septons and maesters writing thousands of years after the fact. Yet, unlike the children of the forest and the giants, the first men of this age of heroes left behind some ruins and ancient castles that can corroborate parts of the legends, and there are stone monuments in the barrow fields and elsewhere marked with their runes. It is through these remnants that we can begin to ferret out the truth behind the tales. But of course, the major problem historians face when attempting to translate and derive meaning from runes carved into rocks and wood is that over the centuries, the lettering wears away, another detail inspired by real-world history. Yandel says, Much of the early history of Westeros is lost in the mists of time where it becomes ever more difficult to separate fact from legend the further back one goes. This is particularly true of the Stormlands, where the first men were comparatively few and the elder races strong. Elsewhere in the Seven Kingdoms, the runes that tell their stories survive to this day, chiseled into cave walls and standing stones and the ruins of fallen strongholds. But in the Stormlands, oft as not, the first men carved the tales of their victories and defeats into the trunks of trees, long since rotted away. Still, runes carried the early First Men stories into the Andal era thousands of years after their inscription, where they were no doubt poured over by scholars and translated to the common tongue and documented to maintain some of that ancient knowledge and wisdom. In fact, we learn in the World Book that one of the most significant moments in Westeros' past, the crossing of the Arm of Dawn, was told via a thousand runic records. Otherwise, we might not even know that the land bridge existed in the first place. And despite their antiquity, vestiges of the runic system pervade the current story. Beyond the Wall, where First Men culture remained less affected by Andal influence due to the isolation of those far northern free folk, divided from the rest of Westeros by the raising of a 700-foot-tall magical ice barrier— we see Tormund Giantsbane sporting runes of old on his armbands. When John enters the tent of the King Beyond the Wall Mance Raider, George uses this detail to convey that the free folk retain ancient traditions and are somewhat removed from the rest of the Westerosi people. The passage goes, Beside the brazier, a short but immensely broad man sat on a stool, eating a hen off a skewer. Hot grease was running down his chin and into his snow-white beard, but he smiled happily all the same. Thick gold bands, graven with runes, bound his massive arms. Similarly, George uses runic details to establish newly crowned King of the North, Rob Stark, as a true Northman, with his image firmly rooted in First Men culture as opposed to a modern Andal design. When Catelyn first sees Rob's freshly forged crown weighing ominously down on her son's head, we get this description. The ancient crown of the Kings of Winter had been lost three centuries ago, yielded up to Aegon the Conqueror when Torrin Stark knelt in submission. What Aegon had done with it, no man could say. Lord Hostess Smith had done his work well, and Rob's crown looked much as the other was said to have looked in the tales told of the Stark Kings of old, an open circlet of hammered bronze incised with the runes of the First Men, surmounted by nine black iron spikes wrought in the shape of longswords. Of gold and silver and gemstones it had none, 
Bronze and iron were the metals of winter, dark and strong to fight against the cold. And in the Vale, we have the case of House Royce of Runestone, descended from the Preandel Bronze Kings, who wore a special headgear named the Runic Crown. At the turning of the hand, we get this from Sansa Stark. Sansa remembered Lord Yon Royce, who had guested at Winterfell two years before. His armor is bronze, thousands and thousands of years old, engraved with magic runes that ward him against harm, she whispered to Jane. Once again, we see George using runes, coupled with bronze, as with Rob's crown, to convey the proud and ancient first men roots of another faction. Given that the opening prologue presented the Royce's third son proudly ranging for the Night's Watch, a tradition associated with northern houses, we wonder if George is laying the groundwork for House Royce to demonstrate their northern loyalties later in the story, possibly by backing Sansa as a potential northern leader. By establishing these First Men associations early on in the story, setting them aside from the dominant Andal contingent in the Vale, such a political maneuver or alliance from Bronze Yon in the Winds of Winter and beyond will be more believable and effective storytelling. And so there's three strong examples of George using the seemingly minor detail of a runic tradition to set factions aside from the main Andal populace in order to add depth to the world, nuance to the culture, and set up important themes and plot lines that are still yet to fully unfurl. Thankfully, Westeros is no shallow monoculture, but a melting pot of four distinct human cultures, the First Men, the Andals, the Roinar, and the Valyrians, which is what our series here will be exploring in great detail. And on the subject of antiquated communication via runes, we should next consider language. The common tongue, spoken throughout Westeros, was brought over by the Andals, but there were two languages that were once dominant on the continent. First, there was the true tongue, the language spoken by the children of the forest, inspired by the sounds of nature, remembering again that the children call themselves those who sing the Song of Earth. When the first men arrived, they brought with them the old tongue, which, in contrast to the true tongue, was a harsh-sounding language, described as gruff and guttural by Jon Snow when he hears leathers using it. In the North section of the World Book, Yandel explains that the men of the North are descendants of the First Men, their blood only slowly mingling with that of the Andels who overwhelmed the kingdoms to the South. The original language of the First Men, known as the Old Tongue, has come to be spoken only by the wildlings beyond the Wall, and many other aspects of their culture have faded away. Regarding languages, George R. R. Martin has conceded he doesn't develop his languages as fully as his philologist idol J. R. R. Tolkien did for Middle-earth, choosing instead to sketch them in broad strokes to convey spelling patterns and sounds. So we don't know much about the old tongue, but there are a few words inserted here and there to give us a flavour of what the language might sound like. Yeah, in Jon Snow's expedition north in A Clash of Kings, where he infiltrates the Free Folk's camp, he picks up a couple of words. First, his captive and soon-to-be lover Egret tells him the tale of Bale the Bard, where we learn, Sigaric means deceiver in the old tongue, which the first men spoke and the giants still speak. And then when Jon is brought into Mance Raider's tent, the king beyond the wall tells him, The man you took me for is Steer, Magnar of Then." Magnar means lord in the old tongue. Finally, in the world book, under a subsection of the north for the stoneborn of Skagos, we get this. The Skagosi who reside there are little regarded by the other northmen, who consider them no better than wildlings and name them Skags. The Skagosi call themselves the stoneborn, referring to the fact that Skagos means stone in the old tongue. These three words, Skagos, Magnar, and Sigaric, sound to us like they've been influenced by Nordic languages. Once again, we'll refer to North of the Wall as a sort of first men, days of old time capsule and highlight the fact that while the old tongue is no longer spoken in the Seven Kingdoms, it's still prevalent, and in some cases even dominant, among the Free Folk. As Jon Snow notes, the men of Fen spoke the old tongue, and most had only a few words of the common tongue. 
with ex Night's Watchman, Mance Raider singing in the old tongue, and the giant speaking the language, we can see how this other central aspect of First Men culture is being kept alive by the Free Folk. It's no wonder that when we see glimpses of the Free Folk fighting, attacking Castle Black from the south in John's POV, it's like a scene from a First Men battle thousands of years ago. Take this passage. The Thens were there before them. They wore half-helms and had thin bronze discs sewn to their long leather shirts. Many wielded bronze axes, though a few were chipped stone. More had short stabbing spears with leaf-shaped heads that gleamed redly in the light from the burning stables. They were screaming in the old tongue as they stormed the barricade, jabbing with their spears, swinging their bronze axes. So, while there are scant examples of the old tongue on page, these details do add to the impression of First Men culture, and to demonstrate how deeply George was considering all of this when planning his world, there's also the attention to detail he paid to naming. In an online chat with fans in 1999, he said, If you want to figure out a family's descent, the names are a better clue than the eyes. Houses descended from the first men tend to have simple, short names, often descriptive. Stark, Reed, Flint, Tallheart, etc. The Valyrian names are fairly distinct as well. The A.E. usage usually suggests a Valyrian in the family tree. The Andal names are, well, neither Stark nor Targaryen, if that makes sense. Lannister, Arryn, Tyrell. Altogether, with the First Men, George seems to be balancing the inclusion of an ancient and interesting culture in his world with the primitive recording techniques that limit our knowledge and leave us thirsty to know more. This gives the old world the lived-in feel he strives for, making Westerosi history simultaneously intriguing and a faded, half-forgotten memory. He's highlighted the fact that the Age of Heroes is as far away from modern Westeros as Noah and Gilgamesh are from us. And remember that the Dawn Age was thousands of years before that era. But while time wears ancient lifestyles away, the vestiges remain ingrained in the culture of the modern era. As real-world historian David McCullough put it, history is who we are and why we are the way we are. With that grounding, such as it is in their language and culture, up next we'll be exploring the history of the First Men's emigration from Essos to Westeros and how their resettlement gradually turned into an invasion. According to the most well-regarded accounts from the Citadel, anywhere from 8,000 to 12,000 years ago, in the southernmost reaches of Westeros, a new people crossed the strip of land that bridged the narrow sea and connected the eastern lands with the land in which the children and giants lived. It was here that the first men came into dawn via the broken arm, which was not yet broken. In our last segment, we began by speculating on what drove the First Men to leave their homes and Essos behind and cross the Arm of Dorne into what would become Westeros. As Yandel put it, why these people left their homelands is lost to all knowing, but when they came, they came in force. Now we're going to continue where we left off and consider the finer details of the mass migration and explore what they can tell us about the ancient world. So somewhere between eight to 12,000 years ago, approximately two or three times as long ago as the building of the Pyramids of Giza are to us, the first men headed west with a one-way ticket to new lands. We know they journeyed on foot and by horse, for as we learn in the Dornish section of the World Book, unlike the Andals who came later, the first men were not seafarers. They came to Westeros not on longships but afoot over the land bridge from Essos, the remnants of which exist today only as the stepstones and the broken arm of dawn. Given the speculation that the first men hailed from the grasslands of Essos and were therefore landlocked, it makes perfect sense that they were lacking in naval abilities. 
Luckily for them, the Arm of Dorn, the natural land bridge running across the narrow sea from southwestern Essos to southeastern Westeros, was evidently intact and traversable at that point in time. Why no other human culture had spread across the Arm before this point is unknown. Perhaps it was simply a matter of discovery. We can imagine the first men searching for a new home, sending out scouting parties on horseback to evaluate the lay of the land and seek out a new habitat. It must have come as quite a shock to discover not just a new place to live, but an entire continent-sized landmass with seemingly no end. Yandel tells us that... The Dornishmen boast that theirs is the oldest of the seven kingdoms of Westeros. This is true after a fashion. Walking or riding, the eastern shores of Dorn would inevitably have been where the first men first set foot upon Westerosi soil. And, though accounts are vague, the first men do seem to have had a leader who led them into Dorn. We learn from the World Book that, quote, Baritan too is somewhat of a curiosity, a gathering place built at the foot of the reputed barrow of the first king who once ruled supreme over all of the first men, if the legends can be believed. This snippet links with the main story where Theon, as Reek, passes through Barrowton. It says, As he climbed a wide flight of wooden steps to the hall, Reek's legs began to shake. He had to stop to steady them, staring up at the grassy slopes of the great barrow. Some claimed it was the grave of the first king who had led the first men to Westeros. Others argue that it must be some king of the giants who was buried there to account for its size. A few had even been known to say that it was no barrow, just a hill. But if so, it was a lonely hill, for most of the barrowlands were flat and windswept. And then in the histories of fire and blood, we learn that a Lord Dustin once showed the same barrow to Queen Alicen and King Jaehaerys. Whether or not the barrow is really the burial place of the first king is open for debate, but remembering Yandel's sentiment that it would have taken the first men decades, even centuries, to migrate that far north, perhaps we should be sceptical. These are, after all, legends of the north, so it should be no surprise that the north claims ownership of the first king's bones. Houses from the Reach have their own culture, stories, and versions of history. They claim the first king was none other than legendary uber forebear Garth Greenhands. In the Reach section of the World Book, it says, Garth was the high king of the first men, it is written. It was he who led them out of the east and across the land bridge to Westeros. Yet other tales would have us believe that he preceded the arrival of the first men by thousands of years, making him not only the first man in Westeros, but the only man, wandering the length and breadth of the land alone and treating with giants and children of the forest. Some even say he was a god. And more on Garth and those legends from the Reach later. Focusing on the first men's settlement, as we said, it seems that they were not historically a coastal people. If they had been, they might have founded more port towns, shipped more migrants across the narrow sea, fed themselves on the fruits of the sea via fishing skiffs and so on, and relied on the natural barriers of the coast as their defence. While there is at least some evidence of this happening in ancient dawn, for the most part, the first men were a horseback-oriented people who the World Book confirms farmed the land. This means that coming into dawn, they would have needed to push north past the hot dry land and deserts, and the mountains and salt marshes northwards to greener pastures. The first men exploring, searching and spreading upwards would have been an absolute necessity in supporting the ever-increasing wave of incoming migrants. And once they had a foothold in their new land, discovering luscious arable places in the reach where their nascent civilization could thrive, they, quote, raised up ring forts and villages. All of this required space in abundance, and although there must have been plenty of surface room for many first men to inhabit, what we should remember is that much of it was wooded at that point in time. 
yet currently areas north of Dawn are famed for their bountiful stretches of bucolic grassland, evidence when the Tyrells offered to donate food aid to the famished capital city, King's Landing, as part of Marjorie's ascension to becoming queen following the Lannister Tyrell victory at the Blackwater. But it seems in the days prior to the arrival of the First Men, these huge swaths of grassland remained expanses of dense forest. Yeah, the World Book mentions, quote, the vast primeval forest that once stretched from Cape Wrath to Cape Kraken. Today, all that remains of this great wood are the King's Wood and the Rainwood. Given that the area between Cape Wrath and Cape Kraken is huge, encompassing much of the present-day Stormlands, Reach, Westerlands, Riverlands, Crownlands, and Vale, we can conclude that all those thousands of years ago, there were forests everywhere. And the settling and inevitable deforestation would have been fine if the First Men had been the only intelligent species on this continent. But as we know, there were two others, and one of them, the children of the forest, literally worshipped trees. The clue is in the name. Not only did they reside in forest areas, but they had a magical connection with the white and red weirwoods that formed the heart of their culture and tradition. Still, Westeros is a huge landmass, and it seems initially the children didn't feel threatened by the influx of first men. Yandel tells us that it is written that in the beginning, the children of the forest welcomed the newcomers to Westeros in the belief that there was land enough for all. While the notion of a peaceful coexistence might have been as optimistic as it was naive, what this quote does highlight is that there was limited initial conflict when the first men came into Westeros. But given the children required woodland for habitation and the first men needed to fell trees to sustain their farm-based lifestyle, perhaps conflict was always an inevitability. As large as Westeros was, bear in mind that the first men were no small advancing tribe, but boasted significant numbers. According to Yandel, when they came, they came in force. Thousands entered and began to settle their lands, and as the decades passed, they pushed farther and farther north. At some point, the penny must have dropped for the children. that The first men were spreading quickly in increasing numbers and destroying their homes. If the trend continued at such a fast pace, their very existence would be under threat. What's more, the First Men weren't just levelling the forests, but destroying the sacred weirwoods in the process. It says, They took to chopping down the weirwood trees, including those with carved faces, and for this the children attacked them, leading to hundreds of years of war. And as we explored in great detail in our recent Children of the Forest episode, Weirwoods and the children were innately linked. The children's leaders, the Green Seers, were able to magically join with the trees and see through their carved wooden eyes. The whole Weirwood network gave an extra dimension to their consciousness and memory. And vitally, their relationship to the trees formed the bedrock of their religion, which came to be known as the worship of the old gods. While Yandel describes the old gods as the innumerable gods of the streams and forests and stones, we learn from Cranachman Jojen Reed in Bran's time at the Greenseer's Cave north of the Wall that maesters will tell you that the weirwoods are sacred to the old gods. The singers believe they are the old gods. And highlighting just how entangled the children's lifestyles were with the weirwoods, Jojen says in the same passage... The singers of the forest had no books, no ink, no parchment, no written language. Instead, they had the trees and the weirwoods above all. When they died, they went into the wood, into leaf and limb and root, and the trees remembered. All their songs and spells, their histories and prayers, everything they knew about this world. The singers going into, or becoming the trees, implies that the earliest form of worship in Westeros was ancestor worship, sometimes known as manism, which most cultural anthropologists agree is at the root of religion. 
From manism to animism, the belief that there is a spiritual element inherent in all natural objects, referred to in Yendel's description of the old gods, is a short step when the ancestors become one with nature itself, and a necessary one for understanding how the worship of the old gods could spread to a new culture. Because, of course, the first men themselves would one day learn directly just how special and magical the weirwoods were when they came to embrace the old gods as their own religion, rather ironically standing with the children to violently oppose the Andals chopping down the trees. But given that's thousands of years away, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Here the first men were felling weirwoods initially due to farming, but as the conflict broke out and began to spread, the children no doubt began to weaponize the trees. In response, the first men must surely have targeted the weirwoods, leading to a vicious cycle of weirwood desecration. From the perspective of the first men, they might have been initially fixated with supporting their growing numbers. Larger villages and more mouths to feed meant more farmland was required as a matter of survival. But they also perceived a threat in the weirwoods. Surely the idea that another species is constantly observing you would be unsettling, to say the least. As Yandel puts it, it was the first men's fear of the weirwoods spying upon them that drove them to cut down many of the carved trees and weirwood groves to deny the children such an advantage. And so war was born, and the first men's ranks were constantly bolstered by yet more arrivals. The World Book gives us this. As the centuries passed, they came in ever-increasing numbers, claiming the Stormlands and the Reach and the Riverlands for their own, eventually reaching even the Vale and the North. They drove the elder races before them, slaughtering giants wherever they found them, hewing down weirwood trees with their bronze axes, making bloody war against the children of the forest. While the weirwood network was clearly advantageous for the children, the first men held many advantages of their own. They were physically larger and stronger and more numerous than their foe, and so fighting in the open would have left the diminutive species vulnerable, as they had been against the giants. Next, they had mastered horse husbandry so they could transport large numbers of troops across open land very quickly, not only acting as a force multiplier, but improving logistics considerably. And last but not least, the first men had better technology and more advanced weapons. Yeah, as we covered earlier, the first men knew how to work bronze, and so could forge metal swords, shields, and armor. Of course, bronze wasn't formidable as steel, which came later down the timeline, brought to Westeros by the Andals. But at that point in time, and in that situation, such weaponry would have given the first men a tremendous advantage. In contrast to the first men kitted out in sturdy bronze armour, such as we see in House Royce, we learn via Maester Lewin that, quote, in place of mail, the children wore long shirts of woven leaves and bound their legs in bark. So, bronze versus tree bark tells its own story, and in fact, this difference in armour gives us a huge clue as to what sort of warfare was likely going on. Covered in bark, the children would have blended into the woodland, hoping to draw the first men into their preferred environment. In the opening prologue to A Song of Ice and Fire, we learn via the Night's Watchman Will the pitfalls of fighting in the forest with a sword. The trees press close here, Will warned. That sword'll tangle you up, my lord. Better a knife. Yeah, combat within the forest would not have suited the first men at all, remembering that not only would the children be able to use camouflage, but as little squirrel people, as the giants know them, they could have moved quickly and freely up the trees and over the canopy. We can't help picturing the bronze-clad first men like the armoured Spanish conquistadors foolishly attempting to penetrate the jungles of South America to their peril. And we know, due to the aforementioned giant's burial with obsidian arrowheads found amidst the extant ribs, that the children were using bows and arrows, and later learn from Jon Snow after his direwolf ghost discovers a dragonglass cache at the Fist of the First Men, 
that obsidian holds a razor-sharp edge. In fact, in the real world, obsidian has even been used for precision medical surgeries. And to top it off, the children had magical powers over animals, which would potentially be devastating in an environment of woodland where traversing and retreating would have been extremely difficult. As Yandel puts it, the green seers employed their arts, and tales say that they could call the beasts of marsh, forest, and air to fight on their behalf direwolves and monstrous snowbears, cave lions and eagles, mammoths and serpents, and more. Can you imagine being a first man ordered to scout the forest, sensing someone or something is watching you, the enemy melting into the trees, the ominous sound of a wolf howling in the distance that you know could attack you at any moment? Certainly the notion of an unseen enemy in the trees using any means necessary against a foe with superior weaponry puts us in mind of some of the issues faced on both sides in the Vietnam War. And so with all of these disadvantages mounting up, the first men surely would have sought to avoid seeking out the children of the forest on their own turf. Out in the open, tree bark and dragon glass would have been of little use against forged bronze. Maester Lewin tells Bran in the Game of Thrones that the wars went on until the earth ran red with the blood of men and children both, but more children than men, for men were bigger and stronger, and wood and stone and obsidian make a poor match for bronze. While we've noted that dragon glass can cut as sharp as razors, it's a brittle substance and therefore more suited to arrowheads and short knife blades than swords. And so, just as the children would likely have attempted to draw their foe into the forests, the first men would have wanted to fight in the open. One huge advantage they had here is that while their own settlements were eventually protected by ring forts, they could gradually destroy the children's habitat and defenses over time remembering that this conflict raged for many generations. A war of attrition would therefore have suited the first men, who could fell trees and push back the forest. Once it was gone, it was gone. And the picture we're getting here is of two factions whose different combat styles highlight their vast differences in culture. Both must have seemed alien to the other, and both must have lived in fear. As Yandel says, the first men came with bronze swords and great leathern shields riding horses. No horse had ever been seen on this side of the narrow sea. No doubt the children were as frightened by the horses as the first men were by the faces in the trees. And although there were no doubt horrors experienced on both sides, over time the first men gained the upper hand and found themselves on a front footing. The World Book explains that the hunters among the children, their wood dancers, became their warriors as well, but for all their secret arts of tree and leaf, they could only slow the first men in their advance. But next came something the first men would never have suspected in their wildest dreams. The children, afraid for their very existence, are said to have been driven to a desperate act. In the accounts of this legend, the Greenseers called upon dark magic to create two Hammer of the Waters events. We went into great detail about this in our recent Children of the Forest episode, so we'll be brief here and keep the focus on the First Men, but if the legends are true, the children summoned two cataclysmic earthquakes that reshaped the landmass of Westeros. First of all, the Arm of Dawn was shattered into what we now know as the Stepstone Islands, effectively destroying the land bridge from Essos, uniting the Narrow Sea and the Summer Sea. Next, the neck was split, flooded with so much water that the area leading to the north became a giant swamp. Had this manoeuvre been successful, it would have split Westeros in two, perhaps intended to give the children and humans different continents. But here, the magic of the Greenseers seems to have fallen short. Of course, those pesky maesters from the Citadel doubt all of this and put the two events down to natural occurrences. On this subject, Archmaester Cassander is cited in the World Book for his tome, Song of the Sea, How the Lands Were Severed. 
It was not the singing of the green seers that parted Westeros from Essos, but rather the song of the sea, a slow rising of the waters that took place over centuries, not in a single day, and was caused by a series of long, hot summers and short, warm winters that melted ice in the frozen lands beyond the shivering sea, causing the oceans to rise. And so Cassandra's global warming take is believed by many maesters of the Citadel, yet most readers, who know how often the maesters get things wrong with their concrete perception of a magical world, wonder from a meta-perspective why George would include the details about the Hammer of the Waters if there was no truth to it. The Maesters don't even believe there are any children of the forest alive in the current story, so why should we embrace their dry scepticism in this vivid fantasy story? Anyway, with our focus on the First Men, we have to wonder what the Hammer of the Waters did to their morale. What was it like to face a foe who could not only skin-change animals and see through trees, but had this godlike level of influence over nature? And what's more, one version of the tale goes that a thousand captive first men were, quote, fed to the weirwoods as a sacrifice to shatter the Arm of Dorne, a terrifying allusion to human sacrifice on a massive scale, rivaled only by the practices of the tribes of Mesoamerica in our real-world history. So as an event, the Hammer of the Waters was a terrifying display of magical power, although the shattering of the Arm of Dawn came too late to save the children. Yandel estimates there were already three times as many First Men as Elder Races in Westeros when the land was severed, a ratio which only increased given the detail that, quote, the women of the First Men brought forth sons and daughters with much greater frequency than the females of the Elder Races. Although Yandel writes that the children and the giants faded whilst the race of men spread and multiplied, raising fields and forests and kingdoms, the war continued to drag on, and the threat of further natural disasters, or unnatural as the case may be, caused by the Greenseers, would only have fed into the First Men's level of war weariness. By that time, the conflict had gone on for centuries, much blood had been spilled on both sides, and so there was finally a call for peace. The Dawn Age was about to reach its conclusion. And in the next segment, we'll look at how a sacred pact between the First Men and the Children ushered in the Age of Heroes, what the land of petty kingdoms looked like back then, and how the Long Night threatened to destroy those populations by enslaving their inhabitants as undead servants of the others. But first, it's time to shout out our patrons from the Valyrian Steel level. Thanks so much to Aileen, Akiva of House Hunt, Oxheart, Anna, Arshia, Blight Spirit, Archmaester Kobe of the Higher Mysteries, Cabeth the Unfrozen, David, Dean, James K, Lord Sosa and his faithful canine companion Theoden, Jill, Miss Jody, JM, Herbert Westeros, the Miskatonic Maester, Casey, Lady Silverwing, Infendaris, the Unspeakable Terror, Maester Paul Capuano, Mark, Boss, Schwartz the Black, Noble Sir Matthew, Sword of the Early Moon, The Sithorian, Sally, Samantha, Tristis Lurian, Wild Child of the Wolfswood, Tim, Magnar of Houston, W, Sword of the Evening, and Lady Dire Liz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. The wars went on until the earth ran red with the blood of men and children both. But more children than men, for men were bigger and stronger, and wood and stone and obsidian make a poor match for bronze. Finally, the wise of both races prevailed, and the chiefs and heroes of the First Men met the greenseers and wood dancers amidst the weirwood groves of a small island in the great lake called God's Eye. What immediately strikes one about the pact is how little the children of the forest asked for. Yandel explains that giving up all the lands of Westeros save for the deep forests, the children won from the first men the promise that they would no longer cut down weirwoods. 
Obviously, after generations of combat and slaughter, the native species were diminished and retreating, so they couldn't hold the greatest sway at the bargaining table. Even so, the right to a habitat and the preservation of their sacred trees was hardly a big ask. Yeah, in hindsight, it's a shame that peace wasn't established before this point. And although we're trying to take on the first men's point of view here, it's difficult not to feel enormous sympathy and regret that the native population suffered such overwhelming losses when a mutually agreeable coexistence would have prevented so much bloodshed and loss. One tragic takeaway from the pact is that such a peace might have been possible all along. With the war over and the children ceding so much territory, the first men would dominate Westeros. Little did they know that one day, invading Andal forces would reverse the roles and have them desperately defending their homes, and even the Weirwoods. But again, that's getting ahead of ourselves. The pact was agreed to on the Isle of Faces, witnessed by the Weirwoods, as Maester Lewin explains to the ever-curious Bran Stark in A Game of Thrones. There they forged the pact. The first men were given the coastlands, the high plains and bright meadows, the mountains and bogs, but the deep woods were to remain forever the children's, and no more weirwoods were to be put to the axe anywhere in the realm. So the gods might bear witness to the signing, every tree on the island was given a face, and afterward the sacred order of green men was formed to keep watch over the Isle of Faces. While we speculated about the intriguing green men in our children episode, rumoured to have horns and green skin, one point to note is that they were called green men, not green children, possibly insinuating that they were first men rather than deriving from the native species. Perhaps they were the first of the first men to learn green magic and the worship of the trees from the elder race that preceded them. Fortunately, George has indicated that one day he'll serve us answers to this enigma, given his admission that the Green Men will come to the fore in later books. And with the signing and sealing of the pact, a new era was born as Westeros crossed the historical threshold from the Dawn Age to the Age of Heroes. The World Book describes this as a time that, quote, lasted for thousands of years, a time in which kingdoms rose and fell, noble houses were founded and withered away, and great deeds were accomplished. We should keep in mind that throughout this era, as millennia passed, the first men continued their runic tradition, and so records and legends are still prone to mistranslation and fancy. Even so, with the information available to us, we can begin to paint a picture of Westeros during the era of the Pact. One point made by Yandel is that the pact seems to have been an extremely effective treaty in establishing a lasting peace. Supporting this, Maester Lewin says, The pact began 4,000 years of friendship between men and children. And so, even with the notoriously vague ancient timelines the Maesters keep, an approximation of 4,000 years presents a significant era of coexistence and once again demonstrate that peace could have worked all along, adding to the sadness of the children's decimation. And Lewin goes on to say that not only was there peace, but in time the first men even put aside the gods they had brought with them and took up the worship of the secret gods of the wood. So, without war, the two species evidently grew closer. Remember that initially the first men were said to have been terrified of the weirwoods, but there was evidently a collective shift in their belief system that led to them embracing the old gods. Converting religions is a huge cultural shift, one that perhaps we can surmise came about because the original religion of the first men was itself animistic in nature, while the children demonstrating the power of skin changing and green seeing, proving the old gods to be a tangible and very useful power, may have played a huge role as well. Yeah, we have to assume that somewhere along the line, the first men began to experience the powers of the green magics firsthand. Whether it began with the green men or not, mankind eventually had skin changers, green dreamers, and green seers in their own ranks. 
In fact, before the World Book was released, fans had wondered if the First Men had engaged in some strange blood magic rites to transmit the magical blood of the children into their own, hence gaining these abilities. However, the World Book contained evidence of intermarriage between the children and the Kranig men who had settled in the now marshy, forested regions of the Neck, giving a whole new dimension to Lewin's comment that the histories say the Kranig men grew close to the children of the forest in the days when the Greenseers tried to bring the hammer of the waters down upon the Neck. These rather shocking details also helps to explain the Kranig men's diminutive physical size. In the World Book, Yandel discusses the so-called Marsh Kings, rulers of the Kranagmen in this era. He says, Singers tell of them riding on lizard lions and using great frog spears like lances, but that is clearly fancy. Were these Marsh Kings even truly kings as we understand it? But perhaps the most intriguing detail comes from Archmaester Iron, who writes that... The Kranogmen saw their kings as the first among equals, who are often thought to be touched by the old gods, a fact that was said to show itself in eyes of strange hues, or even in speaking with animals as the children are said to have done. So, intermarriage with the children of the forest, marsh kings touched by the old gods, humans with strange coloured eyes speaking the true tongue, Well, we can see where George is going with this, highlighting with these not-so-subtle tidbits how the children's magical powers were passed on to the First Men population. We can imagine, in the quiet seclusion of the Neck, in a world of their own, the Kranach-dwelling First Men mingling with the native species, with both sides learning from each other, and eventually, quote, growing close. Given the detail that the Greenseers were leaders amongst the children, no doubt owing to the godlike wisdom their weirnet and skin-changing abilities granted them, we're left to wonder if the Marsh Kings were the leaders of the Kranagmen for the same reasons. But whatever the case, their rule didn't last forever, as the last Marsh King was put to the sword by a king in the north, Rickard Stark, known as the Laughing Wolf. The usage, King in the North, hinting that this event came quite late in the consolidation of power in the North by the Starks, who were originally known as the Kings of Winter. Crucially though, King Rickard wedded the Marsh King's daughter, creating a through line that could have transported the magical blood of the children of the forest by the Marsh Kings into the veins of modern day Starks as Bloodraven will one day tell Bran Stark in the cave north of the Wall while mentoring him in the green arts, your blood makes you a green seer. And so, perhaps with the Kranich men at the root of the crossover, the first men began to embrace the weirwood culture that they had once fought against. Suddenly, the pale trees that had instilled so much fear in them became living deities as well as great assets, Occasionally, one of the first men would be born with the brilliant ability to skin-change animals, and even more occasionally, one would become a green seer. The old gods were now present among their own people. Is it any wonder that there was a mass conversion? Yeah, we've discussed the rather primitive method the first men employed to keep events and histories in order. Well, now they had the power to tap into an organic recording network. Anything done or said in front of a weirwood could be witnessed for all time if the tree stayed intact, potentially forever. Weirwood trees with faces were effectively wooden hard drives with infinite capacity, full of footage of ancestors. It's no wonder that these powers were so closely tied with the children's concept of gods. Green seeing isn't just mind-bogglingly useful, it's an inherently spiritual experience that allows one to traverse time and connect with long-gone generations, creating a sense of cultural continuity and personal immortality. So, what must these first men have thought when they began harnessing these powers? They would have immediately understood why the children saw the weirwoods as sacred, and why they were willing to engage in an unwinnable generational war to defend them. 
When the first men felled the trees, they were effectively deleting entire hard drives with countless generations of footage and information, everything a tree had witnessed in its long lifetime, remembering that weirwoods grow forever if left untouched, would have been gone in an instant. Sacrilege. In the current timeline of A Dance with Dragons, Bran Stark is learning to master the Weirnet, and on his first green-seeing lesson, he accesses the Heart Tree in the Winterfell Godswood, witnessing snippets of an intriguing history. Well, just imagine what he'd have access to if the First Men and then the Andals hadn't destroyed the vast majority of trees. He could potentially watch the First Men's High King entering Westeros, or go even further back to see what life was like before humans had first set foot in Dawn. We've talked about the shortfalls of the runic system, and even the modern books stacked on the shelves of the Citadel will fall apart on a long enough timeline. Weirwoods were the perfect preservers of history, and the first men must have only comprehended the possibilities of these miracle trees long after they had destroyed vast numbers of them. Is it any wonder that their guilt and regret for these crimes against the old gods and nature itself would one day manifest in a bloody defence of the weirwoods? And so we can perceive how much of the first men's culture came from the children. The Kranich men are frowned upon by many modern characters, yet they bridged a gap between the two species and are therefore extremely important to the lore and histories of this world. The children were initially the sworn enemies of the First Men until the invaders agreed to peace and began to see the world through native eyes. Ultimately, George is loading the subtext with messages and themes regarding invasion, colonization, assimilation, and the plight of native cultures, things he's not shied away from in any of his work outside of A Song of Ice and Fire. Although the children are a separate species and so a like-for-like comparison with human cultures are not appropriate, we've suggested the Celts versus the Tuathidanan of Irish mythology as an analogue here. The author is undoubtedly drawing from his extensive knowledge of real-world history and mythologies in many places. And now we've told the story of the First Men's journey to Westeros and the subsequent war and peace, it's time to gauge what Westeros was like during the Age of Heroes. Of course, the Age of Heroes began around 10,000 years ago and lasted for thousands of years, making for a blurred timeline, but we'll work with what we have and set off on a tour of Westeros to see what can be gleaned about the First Men's civilization during that era including what happened in the defining moment of the era, the horrific Long Night. With so much land ceded to them, the first men at last had room to increase. From the land of always winter to the shores of the summer sea, the first men ruled from their ring forts. Petty kings and powerful lords proliferated, But in time, some few proved to be stronger than the rest, forging the seeds of the kingdoms that are the ancestors of the seven kingdoms we know today. The names of the kings of these earliest realms are caught up in legend, and the tales that claim their individual rules lasted hundreds of years are to be understood as errors and fantasies introduced by others in later days. A clue to what the Westerosi political map looked like thousands of years ago, long before the Andals and the Targaryens defined the so-called Seven Kingdoms, comes from a folktale that has no doubt been passed on by word of mouth around the North for generations. That's right, we're talking about Old Nan's story about the Long Night that she scares the young and impressionable Bran Stark with early in A Game of Thrones. She says... Now those were the days before the Andals came and long before the women fled across the narrow sea from the cities of the Broin, and the hundred kingdoms of those times were the kingdoms of the first men who had taken these lands from the children of the forest. We hear this phrase, hundred kingdoms, repeatedly through the text. Jon Snow hears from another character, wise in law, Maester Aemon, that the men of the old Night's Watch, quote, came from a hundred quarrelsome kingdoms. 
and while Yandel tells us that the ancient harbour town of Duskendale had been a seat of kings of old in the days of the Hundred Kingdoms, he also urges caution about interpreting the phrase too literally, saying, We speak of the Hundred Kingdoms of yore, though there was never a time when Westeros was actually divided into a hundred independent states. And so the impression we get is of a land divided and ruled by many leaders jostling for power, with no clear boundaries or dominant factions, but instead countless petty monarchies rising and falling all over the map. But as minor as these kingdoms might seem compared with the modern political system, as Yandel puts it, from such petty domains arose the mightier kingdoms that came to dominate Westeros in the millennia to come. So within this patchwork of fleeting, small kingdoms were the seeds of many of the modern houses that claim first men descent. But before we explore the houses and proto-houses of first men Westeros, we must first return to Old Nan's story and consider the impact of an event that brought humanity to its knees, the Long Night. And we covered the mystery, speculation and detailed information on the Long Night most recently in our episode 76 on The Others. So here we'll contain our analysis to a brief walkthrough of the devastation from the First Men's perspective. As the First Men established their realms following the pact, little troubled them save their own feuds and wars, or so the histories tell us. It is also from these histories that we learn of the long night, when a season of winter came that lasted a generation, a generation in which children were born, grew into adulthood, and in many cases died without ever seeing the spring. Roughly 8,000 years ago, a strange magical icy species emerged from the far north of Westeros in a time of total darkness, marching southward to slay the First Men and resurrect their corpses to gather an undead army. Old Nan describes the others as cold things, dead things, that hated iron and fire and the touch of the sun and every creature with hot blood in its veins. And keeping in mind the aforementioned picture of Westeros as a chaotic struggle between a hundred kingdoms, Nan says they swept over holdfasts and cities and kingdoms, felled heroes and armies by the score, riding their pale dead horses and leading hosts of the slain. With Westeros divided into so many small kingdoms, it was surely nigh on impossible to bring humanity together as a united force, meaning the others could roam freely, picking off one modest army after the next, swelling their ranks as they went. To further dampen the spirits of the first men, and aside from the literal darkness, the others brought with them a freezing cold, ruining lines of communication and transport, and destroying farms and essential crops. An old Nan's tale really captures the terror the first men must have felt. It says even maids and suckling babes found no pity in the others. What's more is that initially the ranks of human defenders could find no weakness in their foe, who continued their devastating march southward without effective resistance. The others were an enemy who could make your environment so cold that basic survival was beyond difficult, and thus they seemed impossible to defeat. The first men almost lost all hope. Fortunately, though, there was one warrior who was spirited and clever enough to turn the tide of war. The legendary last hero, as he's now known, set off on a quest to find the children of the forest in the hopes they could shed some insight on the other's vulnerabilities. While, after years of searching, he lost his companions, horse, and dog, his perseverance eventually paid off when he found the children in their secret cities. The children, privy to the power of ancient magics, obliged with his request for help, perhaps informing the last hero of the other's Achilles' heel— They were vulnerable to the obsidian weapons the children were known to have mastered. The next thing we know, via Samuel Tarley's research in the Castle Black Library, is that the last hero ultimately, quote, slayed the others with a blade of dragon steel. Supposedly, they could not stand against it. 
And so the first men, children and an early iteration of the Night's Watch eventually banded together to defeat the others and save Westeros. This ancient knowledge is now extremely valuable given the re-emergence of the others in the current story, highlighting the importance of folklore, the runic system and information stored within the Weirnet. If the North, and by extension all of Westeros, is to survive this second wave of White Walker attacks, they need to stay in touch with their First Men roots. And it's interesting to consider how the widespread devastation during the Long Night, especially around the North, might have shaped the socio-political landscape of the region. We don't think it's a coincidence that soon after the others were defeated, House Stark was founded by legendary Northerner Brandon the Builder, which signified the beginning of the end in the north of the Hundred Petty Kingdom system we've discussed. But according to legend, Brandon didn't stop after building Winterfell, going on to raise the wall as well. As Jon Snow thinks in A Storm of Swords, Brandon the Builder had laid his huge foundation blocks along the heights wherever feasible, and hereabouts the hills rose wild and rugged. And in the World Book, there's a very interesting illustration of a man presiding over the building of the wall with a child of the forest on one side of him and a toiling giant dragging forth a block of ice on the other. Brandon securing the assistance of the giants and the children in this most ambitious of construction projects denotes an interesting cooperation between the three species. Maester Childer, in his tome Winter's Kings, or the legends and lineages of the Starks of Winterfell, claims to know of a northern song telling of a time when Brandon sought out the children and was taken to a secret location where he, quote, learned to comprehend the speech of the children. And there's further evidence of continued cooperation between men and children when Samuel informs John that, the children of the forest used to give the Night's Watch a hundred obsidian daggers every year during the Age of Heroes. And so, if tales are true, the three species came together to raise the wall and keep the existential threat of the others at bay. The wall divided the land of the far north, with foundations 300 miles long being built upon year by year until, in modern times, it towered over the Night's Watch castles, a colossal 700 feet high. But an unfortunate side effect of the construction was that the population of men who now call themselves the Free Folk ended up trapped on the other side. And as we've said, this created a sort of time capsule and we bear witness to an entire population caught in the Bronze Age, perhaps without the natural resources to mine iron and advance to new technologies. The Free Folk are true First Men and perhaps it's no wonder, having not mixed their blood with the Andals, that we see a relatively high number of skin changes in their ranks. In fact, of the known non-Stark skin changes in the current story, six belong to the Free Folk. But while the Free Folk might be the best example of traditional First Men, the entirety of the North harks back to those early days. The vast and frigid realm of the Kings of Winter, the Starks of Winterfell, is generally considered the first and oldest of the Seven Kingdoms, in that it has endured unconquered for the longest. The vagaries of geography and history set the North apart from their southern neighbours. So now let's consider what was happening south of the Wall during the post-Long Night era. Given there's a decent spread of information about First Men houses, we can cobble together a snapshot overview of Westeros during the Age of Heroes and perhaps imagine a rough lay of the land. Of course, the region we know the most about, given its First Men traditions remain strong through to the current timeline, is the North. So let's begin there. There are in fact no fewer than 26 northern First Men houses that we know existed before the coming of the Andals. So let's start with the house we all know best, House Stark of Winterfell, which as we said began with Brandon the Builder. Given he's said to have led the construction of the wall, which was erected after the Long Night, we know roughly where we are on the timeline, 
and can surmise that before that point there must have been some proto-Stark faction in the north. Aside from the wall, Brandon is also said to have raised Winterfell, and given the close presence of the Heart Tree, we wonder if the Brandon Stark in the current timeline could one day witness his ancient forebear laying the first stones of his family home. And the building of Winterfell, an enormous castle with formidable defences, must have provided the grounding for the Starks to become a force to be reckoned with. In their ascent, they came to lay claim to the title of Kings of Winter, eventually ruling the North for millennia. But while it's tempting to view the house that gave us Ned, Arya, Sansa, Rob, Jon Snow, and other beloved characters as inherently heroic, we must have learned by now from both real history and fiction that accruing power is usually a bloody business. It was during the period of the Starks ruling as Kings of Winter that ancient ballads claim they waged war against the Giants, their erstwhile allies in building the Wall, driving them from the North forever, as well as defeating a skin changer known as Gavin Greywolf in the so-called War of the Wolves. If these tales are true, it pushes the potential for Starks to have added skin changes to their bloodline much further back into the past than previously assumed. And in the realm of things that might have documentary evidence, the World Book also states that historical proof exists for the war between the Kings of Winter and the Barrow Kings to their south, who styled themselves the kings of the first men, and claimed supremacy over all first men everywhere, even the Starks themselves. Runic records suggest that their struggle, dubbed the Thousand Years' War by the Singers, was actually a series of wars that lasted closer to 200 years than a thousand, ending when the last Barrow King bent his knee to the King of Winter and gave him the hand of his daughter in marriage. Still, following their victory over the Barrow Kings, quote, many other petty kings remained, and it would require thousands of years and many more wars before the last of them was conquered. And so the question arises, were House Stark ever the good guys in this equation? Or was their ascension just as brutal, violent, and morally dubious as the rise of other kingdoms and empires across the map? Yandel notes historic First Men houses, towers, greenwood and frost, none of which have been mentioned in the main series, as being put to the sword while their daughters were claimed as prizes, alongside, quote, scores of lesser houses and petty kings. Among these were the Blackwoods, now of Raven Tree Hall in the Riverlands, whose family tradition maintains they were once kings of the Wolveswood before being driven out by the Kings of Winter, and the War King of Sea Dragon Point, who, according to chronicles found at the Night Fort before its abandonment, was defeated along with his, quote, inhuman allies, the children of the forest, by one of the Kings of Winter. Not only were the War King's daughters married into House Stark, providing a possible third injection of skin-changing blood into the Stark line with the Grey Wolf legend and that of the Marsh King's bookending the tale of the War King, but this marks the first and possibly only time House Stark is specifically noted to have fought against the Children of the Forest, breaking the pact that had been forged so many generations previously. We mentioned the end of the line of Marsh Kings in the previous section, and with the defeat of the Warg Kings and so many others, it seems clear that the Starks initially came to dominate the North because of policies of aggression, up to and including extermination of their rivals. As Yandel says, one by one the Starks subdued them all, and during these struggles, many proud houses and ancient lines were extinguished forever. However, there was one particular house who stood in opposition to House Stark and lived to tell the tale. Going back even as far as the Long Night era, House Bolton and their Red Kings became the Stark's bitterest rivals. Many wars were fought between the two in times of old, and the Starks were not always on the winning side, with Winterfell once burned by a King Royce Bolton II. Still, the Starks eventually overcame their foes to win over the North, just as the influx of Andals was beginning. The Boltons put down their flaying knives, accepted defeat, and became vassals to the now-dominant Starks. 
Of course, these historic tensions echo into the current timeline when Roose Bolton schemes to organize the murder of King in the North Rob Stark and his son Ramsay puts Winterfell to the torch. Overall, the North was always a First Men stronghold and managed to uphold ancient traditions even after the arrival of the Andals. Aside from the First Men houses we've mentioned, there are many others we can verify originate in either the Dawn Age or Age of Heroes. These are current Stark vassals, Dustin, descended from the Barrow Kings, Karstark, an ancient cadet branch of House Stark, Glover, Locke, Toolheart, Reed, loyal Stark vassals and leaders of the Cranogmen since the defeat of the Marsh Kings, and Umber. And that's not to mention the northern mountain clans with ancient lineage. Flints, knots, norries, liddles, wools, and more. The North, as a whole, is an ancient culture that stretches back to early First Men settlements, was greatly influenced by the native children of the forest, and emerged from the Long Night's devastation into an era of petty kingdoms that the Starks came to dominate, heralding a new age. In spite of their eventual submission to Aegon the Conqueror, they retained primary power in the North throughout all those thousands of years up to the point in the modern story when the Boltons ignored the sacred First Men tradition of guest right to betray them. Only time will tell whether the remaining Starks will regroup and vie for power once again, but it seems that ancient bonds are not easily cast aside within the North. Much history, rife with both glory and tragedy, has been made in the lands watered by the River Trident and its three great vassal streams. And now, casting our gaze south, beyond the Cranach Men's swampy neck, we reach the Riverlands. The fact that Yandel describes this region as the beating heart of Westeros owes to the fact that it is both physically connected to every other region apart from Dorne, and that the land, centered around the bountiful Trident River, is ripe ground for settlement and supporting surrounding civilization. Like the North, the area has a rich history dating back to the days of the First Men, with the influence of the Children of the Forest plain to see. Here within the borders of the Riverlands lies the vast lake known as the God's Eye, which holds the mystical Isle of Faces. As we said, this sacred site is where the pact was signed, and to this day contains groves of watchful weirwoods maintained by the mysterious Green Men. Not even the Andals, in all their pious ferocity, were able to conquer the Isle and their blasphemous old gods, and readers are desperate to know what information is stored on the island's weirnet. And not too far away from the god's eye is another of the children of the forest's strongholds, or, should we say, with regret, former stronghold. We first see Highheart on page through Arya Stark's eyes in this passage from A Storm of Swords. The next day they rode to a place called High Heart, a hill so lofty that from atop it Arya felt as though she could see half the world. Around its brow stood a ring of huge pale stumps, all that remained of a circle of once mighty weirwoods. Arya and Gendry walked around the hill to count them. There were thirty-one, some so wide that she could have used them for a bed. High Heart had been sacred to the children of the forest, Tom Sevenstrings told her, and some of their magic lingered here still. No harm can ever come to those as sleep here, the singer said. And Arya thought that must be true. The hill was so high and the surrounding lands so flat that no enemy could approach unseen. At High Heart, Arya and the Brotherhood Without Banners meet a prophetic dwarf woman, widely known as the Ghost of High Heart, an old god-connected character we've previously speculated to be a human-children-of-the-forest hybrid. It's the ghost who says, The oak recalls the acorn, the acorn dreams the oak, the stump lives in them both. And they remember when the first men came with fire in their fists. Given that we learn from the world book that it was the Andals who finally felled these weirwoods, this time with the first men defending the groves alongside the children, we can understand the full tragedy of High Heart. Is it any wonder that local small folk consider the area haunted? 
And aside from a complicated history involving the children, another parallel with the North is that the Riverlands was once similarly scattered with countless petty kingdoms, which rose and fell during the long centuries when the first men ruled Westeros. Sadly, there are scant records of these kingdoms because, as Yandel explains, their histories, entwined and embroidered with myth and song, are largely forgotten, save for the names of a few legendary kings and heroes whose deeds are recorded on weathered stones in runes whose meanings are even now disputed at the Citadel. Among those names are at least a couple whose sole mention in the world book leaves us wanting to know more, namely Shara the Witch Queen and the Green King of the God's Eye, and at least one who is mentioned numerous times in the current timeline, Florian the Fool, apparently here confirmed to be of First Men origin. However, in spite of the lack of written evidence, it is possible to identify some Riverland houses from the current story that date back to ancient days. The World Book notes that the enmity between the Brackens and Blackwoods stretches back thousands of years to before the coming of the Andors, and that the origins of their eternal feud are rooted in the fact that the Blackwoods say they were kings and the Brackens little more than petty lords set on betraying and opposing them, while the Brackens say much the same about the Blackwoods. That they were both royal houses of the Trident seems true enough, and none can doubt that their enmity sprang from some cause so entrenched it has become legendary. Of course, we've noted that the Blackwoods may have originated in the North, but it seems as though their chief rivals in their new locale may have been present there from the beginning. And then there are the Moutons, heavily associated with the legend of Florian the Fool, and the Darries, two houses which survive in the current timeline, and the Strongs and Muds, two houses now extinct. The Strongs were extinguished more recently during the Dance of the Dragons, but in A Storm of Swords, Catelyn Stark looks upon an ancient grave at Old Stones, the ruined former seat of House Mud. The sepulchre belongs to Christopher Mud IV, king of the rivers and hills, and the grave dates to the years before the Andal invasion. Cat thinks, with Christopher V died House Mud that had ruled the Riverlands for thousands of years before the Andals came. And last, but certainly not least, we have the case of Catelyn's birth house, the Lord's Paramount of the Riverlands at the beginning of the current story, House Tully. Regarding Days of Yore, Yandel explains that the Tullys were never kings, though the books of lineages will show you any number of connections to the past. The Tully name appears in many chronicles and annals of the Trident, back unto the days of the First Men. Given that Catelyn's worship of the Seven is a major aspect of her character, we can understand how the Andal invasion forever altered the cultural trajectory of the Riverlands and led the Tullys from being a minor faction to becoming the key figures we know today. And we'll certainly be explaining and exploring this transition further in our upcoming episode on the Andals. The Vale of Arran, a long, wide, fertile valley entirely ringed by the great grey-green peaks of the mighty Mountains of the Moon, is as rich as it is beautiful. Perhaps that was why the first Andal invaders chose to land there when they crossed the narrow sea beneath the banners of their gods. And another region we'll go into great detail on in the next installment of this series is the Vale to the East. Given that it was the landing point for the Andal invasion, the historic accounts of this fertile valley are decidedly Andal-centric. Attempting to stick to the Dawn Age and Age of Heroes here, information is predictably scarce. We do, however, get from Yandel that before the coming of the Andals, the Vale and its surrounding peaks were divided into a score of petty kingdoms, so no surprises there but it was also noted to be thinly peopled, which of course led to its eventual conquest by the Yandel invaders. We do, however, know of several First Men houses in the Vale that survived the Yandel invasion, houses Upcliff, Shet, Royce, Redfort, Hunter, Coldwater, and Belmore all boast First Men lineage. 
But while the Andals would bring battles and pacts and marriages to bear to win over the region, there were some factions of first men who refused to acquiesce and accept Andal overlords. As Yandel puts it, Some of the first men surely survived by joining their own blood with that of the Andals, but many more fled westward to the high valleys and stony passes of the mountains of the moon. There the descendants of this once proud people dwell to this very day, leading short, savage, brutal lives amongst the peaks as bandits and outlaws, preying upon any man fool enough to enter their mountains without a strong escort. Little better than the free folk beyond the wall, these mountain clans too are called wildlings by the civilized. And so the notable clans, Stone Crows, Milk Snakes, Sons of the Mist, Moon Brothers, Black Ears, Sons of the Tree, Burned Men, Howlers, Redsmiths, and Painted Dogs, all trace their lineage back to the First Men, bringing obvious parallels and points of comparisons with the other so-called wildlings north of the wall. What we know of their culture is similar to that of the free folk, who we get much more exposition on, and certainly the way they're viewed by their more civilized neighbors is precisely the same. The Westerlands are a place of rugged hills and rolling plains, of misty dales and craggy shorelines, a place of blue lakes and sparkling rivers and fertile fields of breadlow forests that teem with game of every sort, where half-hidden doors in the sides of wooded hills open onto labyrinthine caves that wend their way through darkness to reveal unimaginable wonders and vast treasures deep beneath the earth. And moving across the map to the west coast, we arrive in the Westerlands, With fertile fields, a coastline teeming with fish, and forests full of game, the Westerlands made an excellent place for the early first men to settle. Yandel says, Once the children of the forest made their homes in the woods, whilst giants dwelt amongst the hills where their bones can still occasionally be found. But then the first men came with fire and bronze axes to cut down the forests, plow the fields, and drive roads through the hill country where the giants made their abodes. Soon the first men's farms and villages spread across the west from salt to stone, protected by stout Mott and Bailey forts and later great stone castles, until the giants were no more and the children of the forest vanished into the deep woods, the hollow hills, and the far north. And to add insult to injury for the children, House Greenfield built a castle entirely of weirwood, known as the Bower, while the domain of the reigns of Castamere, a network of tunnels and caves, sounds suspiciously like it may have originated as a dwelling place of the children. Other ancient houses who still dwell in the Westerlands include Yew, Westerling, Plum, Moorland, Foot, Farman, Crakehall and Bainfort, which were all supported in those days by the rich temperate lands. However, speaking of hollow hills, tunnels, and caves, the true bounty of the region was found in its depths, where veins of gold were discovered and exploited by the legendary founder of House Casterly, called Corlos. Legend has it that after killing two lions in a cave and sparing their cubs, the old gods illuminated the walls to show him the generous gold deposits embedded in the rock. Corlos got to work mining the cave, which was situated at the foot of an enormous rock, and before long, House Casterly became the richest lords in Westeros. The cave was further excavated and fortified into their great seat, known as Casterly Rock, based upon the Rock of Gibraltar and said in the World Book to be thrice the height of the wall or the high tower of Old Town. In real-world terms, that is half again as tall as the Rock of Gibraltar and nearly the equal of our world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. But somewhere during the Age of Heroes, the Casterly name disappears from the annals to be replaced by Lannister, Legend has it, a crafty character named Lan the Clever winkled the rock from the Castellese and through his line a new dominant house in the Westerlands was born. 
While we won't cover the broad and colourful speculations of exactly how he managed to wingle the rock, it is pertinent that Lan was golden-haired and Yandel notes that he came from the east. Some say he was an Andal adventurer from across the narrow sea, though this was millennia before the coming of the Andals. Whatever the case, Lan the Clever highlights the fact that a single character can change the trajectory of history in Westeros, which is why the legends of Lan, Brandon the Builder, the Last Hero, and others endure in the in-universe storytelling and folklore to this day. It's not called the Age of Heroes for nothing. And of course, the Lannisters remain the dominant house in the Westerlands through the current timeline in the era of Tywin Lannister and beyond. Tywin is extra relevant to this discussion of ancient houses because he essentially snuffed out houses Rain and Tarbeck, the former of which are confirmed by Yandel to be a Dawn Age house. Knowing the Rains might have dwelt in their minds for thousands of years adds an extra layer of sadness to their sudden and brutal demise. Once and always a great realm that reaches many things to its inhabitants, the most populous, fertile, and powerful domain in the Seven Kingdoms, its wealth second only to the gold-rich West, a seat of learning, a center of music, culture, and all the arts, bright and dark, the breadbasket of Westeros, a nexus of trade, a home to great seafarers, wise and noble kings, dread sorcerers, and the most beautiful women in all Westeros. And heading southward once again, we come to the Reach, a large region with generous lands known for its expanses of endless fields and farms. But the Reach wasn't always the Reach, as for thousands of years, the region was separated into four distinct areas. Yeah, the World Book tells us that there was an independent Old Town and its outlying territories, the island of the Arbor, famous for its wines, and the western marches bordering on Dawn. Then there was the Reach proper, mostly surrounding the course of the River Manda and containing the vast areas of countryside we've mentioned that support many villages and towns. And it was the ancient house gardener that once ruled over the Reach proper, but to tell their story, we must first consider their legendary forebear, Garth Greenhand. Yeah, whatever the truth of Garth, and it's difficult to say what that truth might be given the accounts range from inspiring gardener to demigod, many houses in the Reach proudly consider themselves to be his descendants, with the stories about his prodigious ability to exploit fertile lands becoming a metaphor for his own virility. As Lady Olena Tyrell put it to Sansa Stark in A Storm of Swords, Garth liked to plant his seed in fertile ground, they say, I shouldn't wonder that more than his hands were green. And we've mentioned that some versions of the legend declare Garth as the original High King of the First Men, leading his people across the Arm of Dawn. All is shrouded in myth and legend when it comes to Garth, including several more fanciful versions of this story we won't go into here, save the pertinent claim that Brandon the Builder was his descendant but he's certainly a figure inextricably linked to the First Men of the Reach, their grand achievement of transforming those forested lands into the farmland Yandel dubs the breadbasket of Westeros, and their success at forming enduring houses, some of which still thrive through the current timeline. And one of the famed Reach houses claiming Garth to be their progenitor was House Gardner, like elsewhere in Westeros, the era of the Hundred Petty Kings was no different in the Reach. Yandel says, Here too the first men strove against the children of the forest, rooting them out from their sacred groves and hollow hills, hewing down their weirwoods with great bronze axes. Here too kingdoms rose and fell and were forgotten as petty kings and proud lords contended with one another for land and gold and glory, whilst towns burned and women wailed and sword rang against sword century after century. Yet there was a crucial difference between the Reach and other areas which allowed a leading house to emerge from the regional conflict. 
given that almost every nearby house claimed descent from Garth Greenhand, there was a kinship between the different factions. When House Gardner became increasingly powerful, this legendary kinship might have dampened the appetite of other houses to stand against them, especially since their throne, the Oaken Seat, grew from a tree Garth himself had apparently planted. Yandel says... Others might style themselves kings, but the gardeners were the unquestioned high kings and lesser monarchs did them honour, if not obeisance. And for centuries the gardeners fought against the naval aggression of the Ironborn, who raided the surrounding islands and the river Mander frequently, even taking over the Shield Islands for a time, from where they raided the Reach with impunity. After the deaths of at least six gardener kings, it says... Victory was at long last theirs. Yandel also notes that each of these kings, quote, pushed the domains of House Gardener farther and brought more lands and lords beneath the rule of High Garden. And so the years of warring against a common foe galvanized the region and further legitimized House Gardener, whose more peaceful kings expanded the boundaries of their domain in other ways, such as drawing Old Town into the fold via packs and marriages rather than sword and shield. The petty kings remained, but all swore fealty to their high kings at Highgarden. And when King Garth Gardner VII, known as the Golden Hand, defeated both the Storm King and the King of the Rock, who had allied with the intent of conquering the Reach, he fixed the borders of his realm by marrying his daughters to both kings, ensuring a lasting peace. There followed a golden age of peace and prosperity in the region, lasting until Golden Hand died and the Andals arrived. And that's a story for another time. But what we will mention here is that House Gardner was eventually extinguished by Aegon the Conqueror, his sisters Rhaenys and Visenya, and their dragons at the Field of Fire, allowing their Andal stewards of House Tyrell to take over the reins of their domain. But other First Men houses live on in the Reach. Tarly and Peak from the Western Marches, Redwine from the Arbor, and Rowan, Oakheart, Fossaway, Florent, Crane, Bulwer, Beesbury, and Ball from the Reach proper. Of House Hightower, who ruled the area around Old Town, the Whispering Sound, and the lower reaches of the Honeywine, we can only say that they were present in those days, but their origins are uncertain. Whether they are first men or perhaps some seafaring folk who predated them, the story of House Hightower is also one for another day. And last but not least, we have the case of the Mandalese, an ancient first men house who, after generations of conflict with the neighbouring peaks, were driven out of the reach by the gardeners sometime after the Andal invasion. The Mandalese would find a new home in the north where they were accepted by the Starks and settled at one of their far-flung fortresses, the Wolf's Den, on the banks of the White Knife. This aspect of reach-stroke northern history comes to the fore in the main series when the Mandalese reveal that their loyalty to the house that welcomed them will never waver. The storms that blow up the narrow sea are infamous throughout the Seven Kingdoms and in the Nine Free Cities as well. Though they may arise in any season, seafarers say that the worst of them come each autumn, forming in the warm waters of the summer sea south of the Stepstones, then roaring north across those bleak and stony islands. More than half continue north by northwest, according to the archives at the Citadel, sweeping over Cape Wrath and the Rainwood, gathering strength as they crossed the waters of Shipbreaker Bay before slamming into Storm's End on Durand's Point. And now let's take a look at the first men of the Stormlands. If the Westerlands' value came from their mines, the reaches from their fields, then the Stormlands' great asset in ancient days was its forests. In the Stormlands section of the World Book it says, The forests shaped the first men who made their homes beneath the ancient oaks, towering redwoods, sentinels and soldier pines. By the banks of small streams rose rude villages where folk hunted and trapped as their lords permitted. The firs from the Stormlands were well regarded, but the true riches of the rainwood were found in its timber and rare hardwoods. 
But of course, we know who else valued the forest during the Dawn Age, not for the value of its timber, but for its value as a habitat. And so this is one region where the war against the children of the forest raged on until the pact. But by then, Yandel says, the giants were almost gone from the stormlands, and even the children were much diminished. Another regional consideration when considering the Stormlands is that, due to the unending forests, the Stormlands was historically less populated than other places. Added to the horrendous storms and winds that give the domain its name, we get a picture of a sparsely inhabited area that, like the North, shaped hard people. The World Book states, The people of the Stormlands are likened to their weather, it has oft been said, tumultuous, violent, implacable, unpredictable. And while information about First Men houses in the area is scant, due in part to the fact that runes in the Stormlands were carved into trees rather than the more permanent caves and standing stones found in other regions, we do have some accounts related to the ancient leaders, House Durandon. We're told that, compared with their current borders under House Baratheon, before Aegon's conquest, before even the coming of the Andals, the warrior kings of House Durandon pushed their borders considerably farther. And histories and lineages become yet more blurred, considering, quote, the bewildering number of King Durans, all named after the founder of their line. The original King Duran predictably is the stuff of local legend, having apparently seduced Eleni, the daughter of the sea and wind gods. When Eleni yielded to Duran's overtures, she became mortal, incurring the wrath of her stormy parents. Every time Duran built a house, the wind blew it away until he employed a boy to build an immovable castle. The castle's name was Storm's End, and the boy's name was, wait for it, Brandon the Builder. Over the next millennia, King Duran, whether one near a mortal soul or 50 successors all with the same name, extended the influence of Storm's End by treaties, marriages, and conquests. The World Book describes a blur of Durans taking territory from the children of the forest, returning it, then taking it back again, and slaying the last giant king along the way. In later centuries, the Durandans took the beautiful Isle of Tarth into their domain via marriage, then claimed Estermont, then, quote, extended the kingdom northward to the Blackwater Rush, from there, they were able to launch a conquest across the river to overcome the defiant petty kings of houses Darklin and Mooton, taking the financially and territorially valuable port towns of Maidenpool and Duskendale as they went. But as Yandel explains, north of Storm's End, the borders of the kingdom have fluctuated over the centuries as storm kings, strong and weak, gained and lost land in a succession of wars, both great and small. Is it any wonder then that this area of dispute would one day be established as the Targaryen stronghold known as the Crown Lands in service to the Iron Throne? And in fact, during the conquest, Argelac the Arrogant, the last of the Storm Kings, was killed by supposed Targaryen bastard Oris Baratheon, who took Argelac's daughter Argella as his wife, hence ending House Durandon and establishing House Baratheon as the Lords of the Stormlands in the modern timeline. But while we cannot say for sure due to the aforementioned lack of historical record, there are a few houses who persist in the region who might be of First Men origin. Based on George's description of his naming conventions, Fell, Wild, and Swan seem like First Men names, while House Karen claims to be as old as House Swan. House Tarth and Buckler are similarly ancient, while House Massey of the Crownlands was almost certainly a First Man house who owed allegiance to the Storm Kings before the conquest. Only a Dornishman can ever truly know Dawn, it is said. The southernmost of the Seven Kingdoms is also the most inhospitable and the strangest to the eyes of any man raised in the Reach or the Westerlands or King's Landing. For Dawn is different in more ways than can be told.
And now we arrive at the southernmost region of Westeros. While Dorne is known for its dry, arid, and inhospitable lands, Yandel notes that there is far more to this ancient principality than that, for it has a history that stretches back to the Dawn Age. We've mentioned that the baking deserts of Dorne drove most of the first men northwards to greener, farmable pastures such as can be found in the Reach, yet that doesn't tell the whole story. Here there were factions of first men who found value there in a wide variety of different environments. The Greenblood River might not have been as bountiful as the other major rivers of Westeros, yet it was generous enough to sustain the tribes of first men who chose to settle along its banks. Some first men even adapted to coastal life and lived off seafood gifted by the narrow sea, while others ventured northwards to settle in the foothills of the Red Mountains, where rainfall allowed for fertile soils. Those explorers, even more adventurous, scaled the mountains to find hidden green pastures at high altitude. And finally, there were those hardy souls who braved the relentless heat of the deserts building their villages around rare oases known to history as the Lords of the Wells. And so, while the majority of First Men noped away at the notion of settling in Dorne, there were still those who learned to shape themselves around its diverse landscapes, defying the many challenges, and finding ways to survive. One advantage newcomers to the area held during this era was that the children of the forest were largely absent, dubbing the region the Empty Land due to its lack of forests and woodland. While the settlers of the Stormlands, Reach and beyond, were warring against the children in their network of spying weirwoods, their Dornish counterparts would have been able to focus on settling in peace. And it seems diverse lands produced diverse people, With the terrain difficult to traverse and Dornish lifestyles so disparate, the various settlements were isolated, resulting in a culture that was difficult to govern and prone to disunity. As Yandel puts it, petty kings existed throughout all of Westeros to be sure, but seldom so many, nor so petty, as the Dornish kings under the first men. While many of these petty kings are judged as not noteworthy by Yandel, there are numerous embryonic houses from Dawn in this age that have endured as among the oldest in Westeros. Yeah, there's House Dane, whose founder apparently followed a falling star to the site of what would be the house seat at Starfall, and then made a wonderful and unique blade from the rock called Dawn. Though not currently a major house per se, they have unique customs and an intriguing history that possibly dates back over 10,000 years, firing readers' imaginations. Then there's House Fowler, whose seat Skyreach is carved into the rock above the Prince's Pass that links Dorne to the Reach, and who stylized themselves as Kings of Stone and Sky when they were one of the most powerful First Men factions in Dorne. And to the east, House Ironwood became a force to be reckoned with in the green valleys by the Stoneway, an area rich in ore deposits, perhaps making them a regional equivalent of the Castellies of the Westerlands in ancient times. That the Ironwoods called themselves the High Kings of Dawn conveys just how rich and powerful they once were, and to this day they remain the second most powerful Dornish house behind the Martells. Yet the Ironwoods were not the only faction to stylize themselves as Dornish High Kings, as in the World Book we learn of a collection of a dozen houses, including wades, shells, holts, brooks, hulls, lakes, brown hills, and briars, and notice the short descriptive first men names there, that together claimed kingship from their base near the Greenblood River. And there's evidence of First Men democracy here, as Yendel conveys that every time a High King died, the Houses would hold an election to choose a successor. Sadly, this system fell apart when a dispute set the families against each other, and three of those Houses were wiped out forever. And of course, Dawn would one day become yet more diverse when Princess Nymeria of the Roynar led her people west, fleeing the brutality of the Valyrian freehold in a ragtag fleet known as the Thousand Ships to land near the mouth of the Greenblood. 
While that's a story for another time, what's pertinent here is that modern Dawn is said to be comprised of three types of Dornish folk. Of the sandy, salty and stony varieties, Yandel says that it is the latter group, mountain dwellers with fair skin, who most often boast first men roots. Were the first men truly first? Most scholars believe they were. Before their coming, it is thought, Westeros belonged to the giants, the children of the forest, and the beasts of the field. But on the Iron Islands, the priests of the Drowned God tell a different tale. And with mainland Westeros covered, we shouldn't forget the Iron Isles. Unfortunately, the ancient history of the Ironborn is murkier than the rest of Westeros, while Yandel explains that the accepted view from the Citadel is that they were descended from the First Men, the Ironborn themselves disagree. The World Book tells us that, according to their faith, the Ironborn are a race apart from the common run of mankind. We did not come to these holy islands from godless lands across the seas, the priest Saron Saltung once said. We came from beneath those seas, from the watery halls of the drowned god who made us in his likeness and gave to us dominion over all the waters of the earth. Given that the Ironborn's strength has always been their naval abilities and that the first men are pointedly noted to have not been seafarers, we can understand the debate. For obvious reasons, it's difficult to know exactly what happened on the Iron Islands in ancient days before the Ironborn began reaving the western coastlines of Westeros. What's certain is that even if they do have first men roots, they've always maintained a unique culture revolving around their drowned god that sets them proudly aside from the mainlanders. While the North and Dorne are also noted to be somewhat aside from the rest of Westeros, the Ironborn remain further apart by some distance. And so that concludes our overview of First Men Westeros. Over the course of this episode, we've witnessed the first mass migration into Westeros as the First Men sought to settle new lands which eventually put them at odds with the native elder races. Gradually, over the many centuries of war and aggression, they devastated the populations of children and giants and came to dominate the continent with their countless kingdoms. But that's not the end of the story. In the next episode in this series, we'll see how the first men found the boot on the other foot when the second mass migration occurred and streams of Andal invaders attempted to get a foothold in and then control Westeros. The coming of the Andals around four to 6,000 years ago turned the petty kingdoms of the First Men upside down and shattered the peace and protection the pact had offered the children of the forest. We look forward to covering the Andals' motives and culture, as well as all the battles and alliances that led to their eventual victory. We'll also catch up on what that meant for the First Men culture, but for now we can contemplate how that culture persists in the present timeline. In the North, the old gods are still worshipped and ancient traditions are honoured to this day. And even further North, beyond the Wall, the Free Folk maintain many of the old ways, along with their cousins in the mountains of the Vale. As we've seen today, all over Westeros, ancient First Men legends are perpetuated in the stories, songs and folklore that have pervaded for millennia. When the Northerners chanted King in the North at Rob Stark, George was letting us know that the heart of First Men culture, while greatly diminished from days of yore, still beats on in Westeros. We hope you've enjoyed this episode all about the First Men of Westeros. We'll be back soon with the next installment in our series covering Arya Stark. And now, as always, it's time to give credit where credit is due. Thanks to George R. R. Martin for his incredible depth of world building, and thanks to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use his music in our production. And as usual, we'll end today with thanks to our patrons from the Castle Steel level. If you enjoy the podcast, consider being a patron and you could be hearing your name here too. Our sincere thanks to Atori Loon, 
AJ, Egg on the Sixth, Alex, Ali B, Ali C, Nessie the Questing Beast, Ashanat Yara, Oakenfist, Brand the Builder, Brian, Camille, Casey, Charitable Rereadings, Chris, Christian, Maddie and Jessica, Sir Clint the Andal, Sir Duncan Cole, Convenience or Death, Courtney, David, Dimitri B, Dennis, Lady Diana Dane, Esme, Liza, Emily the Erie, Evan, Ezra, Felix, Fermin, Sir Gladworth, Sir Gregor the Toasty, Lord of the Breadfort, Ingvild, Isaac, Jim McGeehan, Winter's King, John Aris, Rider of the Ice Dragon, Cenarion the White Storm, Julie Beth Tarth, Judson, Katie, Lady Kelly, Mistress of the Old Bay of Crabs, Kenneth, Tree Girl, Sir Galahoo of What, Lena Snow, known as the Twilight Star, Lemba, Lynn, Lomas Knight Rider, Survivor of the Yeen Sleepover, Mage Marmot, Monaro Geek TV, Maria, Margareta, and our cohort of Matts. Matt A, Matt C, Matt K, Matt L, Matt M, Matt R, as well as Beatrix Rainfall, Maester Mary, Molly, Nimble Nick on Irik, Patrick, Peter Pebble, Peter, PJ, Paul B, Paul H, King Ray, first of his name, Richard, Sam, Sarah, Sir Swift, the Peppered Knight from the House of Black and Gray, Sheila, Cern, That Shiny Bastard, The Rat Chef de Cuisine, Terry, Sir Terrence, Knight of the Cedars, Val and Valentine, Maiden of the Black Frost, Quarren Halfhand, and Yvonne. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong. If you have a name,